So this afternoon I'd like to talk to you about a closer walk with God. A closer walk with God. Certainly we can all stand to uh, get a little closer to God, amen? Uh, in Genesis, Genesis chapter uh, 5, verse 22, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. <clears throat> Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. Why is that significant? If you look up and do a study on the name Methuselah, you'll find out that Methuselah means when uh, he is gone, it will come. And so if you look at the scripture, you'll see that Methuselah died the day the flood came upon the earth. The day that the rain began to come upon the earth, Methuselah died. And so we understand that this was a revelation to Enoch from God, and he named his child after the revelation. This is not uh, strange or uh, unheard of. This happened all the time in the scripture, where patriarchs would name their uh, children, especially their sons, would name them after a revelation or a, a milestone of some sort in their life. So their children were, their, were, were named after their legacies, were named after their uh, revelations uh, that they received from the Lord as well. And so here we see uh, Enoch is being named, uh, or is naming his son Methuselah. And interesting enough, uh, Methuselah's name, or his uh, age, he's the oldest man in, in the scripture, recorded in the scripture, 969 years old when he, when he died. And what's interesting about that is that it shows you the long-suffering of God. The scripture says that the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah for the preparing of the ark. So all the time that it took Noah to prepare the ark, Methuselah was, a, was able to live. He could continue to live on the earth. But as soon as Noah was finished and God began to rain on the earth, began to send rain, uh, Methuselah died. And so why is that significant to a closer walk with God? Because I believe the more that we understand where we are, understand what's coming, when we fully, really understand, where we have conviction about God's judgment, and we know that judgment's coming, it will cause us to walk closer to God. One reason is we don't want to be left behind. Enoch did not want to be on the earth when the flood came. Now we see that Enoch walked with God. He was not, for God took him. And it says that he walked with God uh, just like Noah walked with God, but Noah was a little different. It says, it says Noah was moved with fear to prepare the ark. We don't see that with, with Enoch. We don't see that Enoch was moved with fear. And we see that uh, the Enoch walked with God uh, just like we see that God walked in the cool of the day with Adam. There was a relationship that God had with Enoch uh, and also had with Noah. And without question, this goes along with hearing God's voice. This goes along with uh, a, a revelation and hearing God's voice, God's revealed word, hearing his, his voice every day. 
That's how you walk with God, is hearing his voice, knowing his voice. And we see that uh, Adam still could hear God's voice even though he was hiding from the presence of God. Even though he was afraid and he was moving from the presence of God, he still... Um, he, he still was hearing God's voice. And there are people today hearing God's voice, but they're, they're hiding from the presence of God. And so the Lord in this hour is speaking directly and indirectly. There are those that are hearing his voice indirectly, but there are those that are hearing his voice directly. And I believe it's those that are hearing his voice directly that are going to um, take it take it seriously. Um, but those that are hearing his voice indirectly are those that are going to not take it so seriously. And the scripture, it says they hear the word, but they're not doers of the word. Right. Jesus said, even the uh, wise man uh, or excuse me, even the foolish man heard. His word. But the foolish man didn't do. He wasn't a doer. He didn't obey. He didn't take heed. He didn't listen. And so just because you're hearing God's voice, maybe through a preacher or a pastor, or uh, maybe you're hearing it on the internet, by way of TV, whatever, if you're not obedient to God's voice, it's not going to benefit you. You will not benefit from... Uh, from hearing his voice, if you're not obedient to his voice. And so we see that Enoch walked with God. He was not, for God took him. In the book of Hebrews, it says um, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And um, this is Hebrews 11, verse 5. Um, and, and what does it say? It says, by faith, Enoch walked with God. Amen? Amen. It's by faith that he walked with God. And Jesus said, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? He said to his disciples over and over, he says, where is your faith? He said to them, O ye of little faith. He said to them, how is it you have no faith? Um, but there were places where Jesus would say, great is thy faith. I have not seen so great faith, no, not in all of Israel. So there's measures of faith, different measures of faith. But then there's also where Jesus said, faithless and perverse generation. So there's faithless, there's little faith, there's great faith. And so where do you find yourself in this hour? Do you have great faith? Do you have little faith? Do you have no faith? And I believe it's those that are uh, have great faith that are walking with God. Because you can't have great faith unless you're hearing his voice and obeying his voice. Because I'll tell you right now, if you don't obey God's voice, it may not be long before you don't hear his voice anymore. And you may hear his voice even indirectly, but it's not going to be with conviction. We see in the scripture that it took, uh, you know, it, it took a pricking of the heart to get some folks' attention. Because for the most part, people didn't believe the word of God. And we see that the disciples didn't even believe. Amen? Amen. Even the disciples didn't believe the word of God. Folks, it wasn't until after the resurrection and after Jesus appeared to them a few times before it finally began to start sinking in. And then it really wasn't until after Pentecost. Then they received an infilling of the spirit and was taken to a new level of faith. 
And I believe with all my heart, if you're going to walk with God in this hour, you've got to walk by faith. You can't walk by sight. You can't live by sight. You can't you can't uh, order your life uh, based on feelings, uh, based on um, you know emotions and, and um, leaning to your own understanding. If you're going to walk with God, you got to hear His voice and obey His voice, and it really is that simple. And where it becomes complicated is when we don't obey God. That's what makes the Word of God complicated. That's what makes our relationship with the Lord complicated, is when we don't obey. It may sound like it's uh, not so profound, but when you understand just how few there are today that are obeying God, then you understand that it is pretty profound. That's really, that's really what makes the difference, saints, men and brethren. That's really what makes the difference. Uh, we see in the scripture, Paul says, if a man has all faith and can move mountains and has not love, it profits him nothing. Amen? And I don't believe you can have the love of God uh, in your heart if you're not obeying the Lord. You can't walk in the Spirit. You can't have fellowship with God. You can't walk with God if you're not obeying Him. So, I believe we can all stand to, to a closer walk with Jesus. A, we all could get closer. There's not one of us that's disqualified. Every single one of us could get closer. And we ought to. We ought to draw near to God in this hour. If, if we draw near to Him, He said He'll draw near to us. Now I know the Lord is challenging us in this hour to walk with Him. To walk closer to Him. To get to the point where not only are we walking with Him, but we get to the place where we become one with Him. Amen. Adam did not uh, have that. Adam never experienced being one with God. God walked with him in the cool of the day, but he wasn't one with God. Um, even though Adam had a full, mature body, he was still a babe spiritually. He had to learn obedience. He had to learn who God was. He had to learn these things. And he learned the same way you and I should be learning, and that's hearing God's voice and obeying his voice. You will never go wrong if you do what God says to do. Where you get in trouble is when you don't do what God tells you to do. Does that make sense? It's when you disobey God. It's when you Now, I know a lot of times that when you think on terms of obedience and disobedience, it can come sometimes it can feel negative. Like you know, obedience is a negative thing. But when you understand the righteousness of God, you understand the truth, you understand the real uh, essence and the the virtue and the uh, principles and the precepts, and you begin to really understand God line upon line, you begin to understand that obedience is a gift. It's not something that uh, that we should look at and say, well, it's negative to obey God. No, it should be a very positive thing. Just like repent. The word repent should not be a negative thing. It should be positive. And I think that a lot of times the things that should be positive in our life end up being negative when we think on these terms that have to do with following and obeying God and walking with God. Folks, there's got to be, there's got to be a maturing in the body of Christ to where we're walking with God, in fellowship with God. And, you know, I've, I'm guilty myself. It had times where I know I heard God's voice and I just dismiss it. How many times you've heard the Lord's voice and you just dismiss his voice? I think we've all done that. But it'll cost you something. 
especially if you know it's his voice emphatically and you disobey his voice. Now, that's a different story. But if you're still learning God's voice and you're still going in between, well, is that God's voice or is that my voice? Then God will give you a little mercy. You know, there'll be mercy given there. They'll, they'll, God is just. God is not going to be unjust and, and just hammer on you because you're still learning his voice. No, it's when you know his voice. Now, I talked to you about this the other day, and I take this very serious. And that is, can you imagine the test when God said to Abraham, take your only son. Interesting how God said, take your only son. God didn't even recognize Ishmael as his son because it wasn't God's promise. Take your son, Isaac, your only son, Isaac. And I want you to sacrifice him to me. Now, did God tell Abraham to offer his son at first? Well, it might be that it, it was step by step. God might have said, okay, Abraham, I want you to take some wood. I want you to take a knife. I want you to take your son. I want you to go up onto Mount Moriah. He might not even have said to him, I want you to sacrifice your son at that point. Maybe along the way, Abraham is wondering, just like Isaac was wondering, Behold, Father, the, the knife, the, the, you've got the wood, got the fire, the torch. Uh, where's the sacrifice? And I wonder, was, you know, was Abraham uh, not told by God that, that Isaac would be offered? And that that's why Abraham said to his son, um, God himself will provide a sacrifice. You know, God doesn't always give us the whole picture, does he? Doesn't give us the whole thing. He wants our obedience. And a lot of times, if you don't know the... What if God would have said fully, completely, Abraham, I want you to offer your son to me. Listen, folks, that's what the heathen were doing. They were doing human sacrifices. And Abraham came out of a family that was into idolatry. We don't know if they did human sacrifices in Tehran, you know, his dad and the idolatry that went on there where he came out of. But we do know this, is that Abraham said to God, or said to his son, God himself will provide him a sacrifice. And I know that for years we've heard that uh, that God uh, said to Abraham, go offer your son. But did he say that right at first? Did he say to him right at first, at, at the beginning? And if he did, think about how much more serious that is. Think about the fact that if God was to drop that bomb on you, how difficult that would be if God was to ask you to do something that in your mind is completely contrary to society, completely contrary to everything that you know and have learned and everything that you are about. And God asks you to do something that even in your mind could actually be illegal. In the eyes of God, sacrificing your children wasn't legal. That wasn't something that God condoned. Are you listening? So why would God ask Abraham to offer his son when it's completely contrary to the word? It's actually contrary to the law. It's, it's contrary. And then we see another place where a man made a vow to God, Jephthah. He had to offer his daughter as a sacrifice to God, even though God didn't ask him to. He made a vow to God and he couldn't go back. So does God accept human sacrifice? When you make a vow to him and you say you're going to do something, you better do it. 
Now, of course, that was in the Old Testament. That's between Jephthah and God. And Jephthah has to answer to God. You and I are not to look at that circumstance, look at that situation, and say, well, because we've got people doing it today. There are people offering their children, saying that they're, sa they're protecting them, saving them from, uh, you know, from this world. Saving them from, uh, from being on this earth when terrible things are coming. And well, we know that God does not condone human sacrifice. We know that he, it never came into his mind. So, I'm just thinking in my mind, what a test. God, am I really hearing your voice? You want me to do what? You want me to what? Can you just think for a moment? Abraham had to know God's voice. He had to know without any question that this was God's voice for him to stretch forth that knife to slay his son. You think about the obedience that was involved. Would you take your only child, your only son, and offer your son? We see it in Islam today. They're offering their children, blowing themselves up. But they don't have a value for life. We know that Abraham valued life. He wasn't like the Muslims. Understand, folks, God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Are you listening? He wanted Abraham's full, complete heart. He wanted Abraham. He didn't want Isaac. He wanted Abraham. And God doesn't want altogether you to do something as much as he wants your heart. He wants you. God wants you. He wants your heart. And if you obey him, that's that's just added. And you will do it if he has your heart. But he wants your heart. That's the first thing. Because there's a lot of people today doing things and thinking they're doing God's service and they're not even doing God's service and God doesn't have their heart. Islam, they think they're doing God's service today. But I believe with all my heart, folks, if we're going to walk with God in this hour, we've got to know God's voice, and we've got to know for sure that we're hearing God. It's God speaking to us and not another voice. I was completely ridiculed, mocked, when God said to me one day when I woke up, He said, don't get dressed. I'm thinking to myself, why not? I didn't say that to God. I'm just thinking that to myself. The Lord had me wear my pajamas. Now listen to this. For several months, my mother-in-law would not let me come to the restaurant and work. Um, my boss where I used to work, would not let me come to work in my pajamas. I actually went and visited someone in Washington from North Carolina and had to get on an airplane with my pajamas on. I had my slippers on, my pajamas. And I, when I look back on this now, I say, God, how did I ever do that? How was I able to do that? If God told you not to put your clothes on, just wear your pajamas, would you do it? Would you go out in public with your pajamas on? I'm thinking to myself while I'm getting ready to get on this airplane. You know, this is during the time when the airports were really, really cracking down. And, you know, TSA was really, 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 you know, screening people. 
I didn't have any bit of problem at all. I walked right through like I wasn't wearing pajamas. Maybe sometime I'll share the whole experience with you. But what my point is, is God wanted my obedience, no matter what people thought. And I, I realized through that obedience just how self-centered or how self-conscious uh, I was. Because I realized what are people, you know, I'm thinking, what are people going to think? I mean, my wife uh, divorced me. My, uh, her, her mother would not let me come to work. I lost everything because, because of obedience to God. And even when my wife came to the airport to pick me up from when I come back from Washington, she treated me like she didn't even know me. After being married to her, I don't know, 14, 15 years. That was a test. I remember the day the Lord spoke to me and said, okay, now you can, you can put your clothes back on. Look, folks, I mean, the prophets in the Old Testament, they, they one prophet, I believe it was uh, Isaiah or Ezekiel, went naked and had to lay on their side. Now, I don't believe they were fully naked. That's something I'm going to have to ask the Lord personally. It doesn't say in the scripture because it says that it says Peter was naked and threw his fish's coat around him. Um, so we don't I, I don't believe Peter was fully stark naked. So what does it mean when it, when when it says the prophet was naked and laid on his side? There were things that God had prophets do that they never would have done if they didn't love God, if they weren't committed. And folks, I'm telling you, for me to wear uh, just my pajamas for, I don't know, I think three months, two, three months went by. I was so glad when God spoke to me and said, okay, you can put your clothes back on. Oh, my. You want to talk about somebody that was happy. But you know what I learned through all that? I learned obedience. I remember in my pajamas as I was, uh, um, I remember that morning so clearly. My wife didn't want nothing to do with me. She didn't want me to go to work with her because we worked together at her parents' restaurant. <clears throat> this might sound crazy to you folks, but God's going to ask you to do things that's not illegal. It's not um you know, it's not something you're going to get in trouble for as far as government-wise or, or, you know. But, I mean, just think. Reese Howell, God told Reese Howell, do not wear your top hat. Don't wear your hat when you go into town. His whole family ridiculed him for that. Because it was not proper for a man to go into the city without his hat on back in those days. In London. And... uh Reese Howells had a hard time with that one. But God wants our commitment. He wants us he wants to know that we are going to obey him no matter what people think, no matter what we think. He wants our obedience. And you know, I look back on that afterwards. It got easier and easier, by the way. Day after day it just got easier to wear my pajamas. And uh it got to the point, folks, where I didn't even realize I was wearing pajamas anymore because I was so clothed with God's presence. It didn't matter. I was walking in God's presence and I knew that even if I was naked like Adam and Eve, I wouldn't have known it. You know what I mean? I'm not saying God would have told me to walk naked or to do that. But what I'm saying is that that's how Adam and Eve did not know they were naked. They were clothed with God's presence. And when I was cold with God's presence, uh, walking around in, in town and, and getting on airplanes and, and traveling with my pajamas on and my slippers, uh, I didn't feel like I was wearing pajamas. There was one point at the airport, I remember, that I looked over and was wondering, are people looking at me strange? Only once. And obviously, I was concerned about getting through TSA. But nobody gave me any problem all the way to Washington and all the way back. Not one problem wearing pajamas. 
you know, you look over and you see a person wearing pajamas, right, in, a, in an airport with slippers on, you're thinking this guy needs to go back to the mental institute. This guy, something's wrong with this guy, right? And this is during the time in the news when right after 9-11 when, you know, when all this was going on with TSA, patting people down, really. This was when it just first started and they had dogs and stuff in there. And nobody gave me any problem because God said, I will make a way where there is no way. Amen. God says, behold, behold, I've set before you an open door and no man shall shut it. And I tell you, folks, I lost my marriage. Um. And I shouldn't say I lost my marriage because it's in my my mind or in my eyes. I see my wife and I still married. But as far as her concern, we're not married anymore. As far as government-wise, as far as the laws of the land, we're divorced. But in the eyes of God, we're still married. But for the last several years, I've lived without my family, lived without my wife and my children. And all of this, folks, because of obedience. Now, how many of you would do it? How many of you would walk in public, get on airplanes with your pajamas on, with slippers? You'd do it if God asked you to, or told you to do it. God didn't ask me to do it. He didn't say, would you, would you like to do this? No, he didn't say that. He said, do not put your clothes on this morning. Leave your pajamas on. And that morning, when my wife was angry at me and upset with me, I got in my car and the Lord said, drive. I've got my pajamas on. And I just got on the intercept and started driving. And I said, what now, Lord? And the Lord said, keep driving. And I'm driving along. All of a sudden, I see this truck stop off to the right. And I'm wondering, where in the world are we going, Lord? I thought, yeah, we're getting we're going to an airport. We're getting ready to go to Africa. We're get I don't I didn't know where we were going. All I knew is that God was going to take me wherever he wanted to go. That, you know, maybe somebody at the airport would be standing there with money to give me, you know, I believe in that. I believe God works supernaturally like that. And I've had it happen in my own life. But this is what happened. I'm going down the interstate and I see this truck tractor trailer over in the truck stop. With big red letters on the outside of the tractor trailer, on the trailer part, it said, Jesus saves. The Lord says, pull in there. I pulled in, drove over there and parked next to the tractor trailer. And I said, Lord, what do we do now? He said, wait. That's all he said. Well, I should have just obeyed the Lord and waited and just sat there and waited. But I didn't. I got impatient, went into the truck stop, into the restaurant area. And I asked if anybody knew the man that owned the truck track trailer. Well, there was police officers in there. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, they're looking at me. They're going to think I'm a cuckoo because I'm standing here in my pajamas. And they never said a thing. They looked right straight at me, never said a word, folks. And I just could feel the presence, the manifest presence of God just covering me. That's what it means in the scripture. It says you're clothed with the presence of God, clothed with power. I don't know what they were seeing. All I know is that they did not look at me like a person wearing their pajamas. Well, the man inside said, yeah, I know him. He comes here all the time um, and he should be right back. In fact, I loaned him my vehicle so him and his wife could get groceries at the store. Well, when they finally got back, I was sitting there waiting for them. And I just, in the spirit, I didn't even think about it. I just walked up to them and I said to him, can I hold those groceries for you? He doesn't know who I am. He's never met me in his life before. Him and his wife never looked at me like, who are you? He just handed me, handed me the groceries so he could get in the door to his trailer of the truck. And I'm thinking, what are they doing going into the back trailer of their truck? I'm thinking, my goodness, this must be just a, a tractor trailer, right? Why are they going in the back? Well, come to find out, folks, what was inside that trailer were pews, like in a church. This was a traveling church on wheels. He go, Him and his wife go to truck stops, and he ministers to the people in the truck stops. And he, ha he opens on something, like he'll, he'll have church. 
the truck uh, the truckers will go into the back of the trailer and he'll preach to them in the back of his trailer so anyway we went into the trailer i was carrying his groceries and by the way that's the other thing is when you're clothed with god's presence you're a servant you're not you're not a big name you're not looking for a position you're just a servant that's the holy spirit as a servant and there was nothing in me that was like, Lord, why do I want to carry his groceries? Let him carry himself. No, it was nothing. It was just like water flowing. I just was compelled. I was compelled to take his groceries and, and just carry them for him. And he didn't even hesitate. He just turned around, handed the groceries to me. He was in the spirit. As soon as we walked into the back, his wife did not sit there. Like you would see today in a lot of churches where the wife is nosy and she doesn't know her position. She's, you know, she's got to be involved in everything. No, she just went into the kitchen part of the trailer in behind the uh, the truck part where their kitchen area is to prepare lunch for him and, um, and put the groceries away. And she closed the door. She didn't stay there and wait to see what, what God was going to do or she needed to be a part of that. See, she was a real woman of God, submitted to her husband. And I would say she was really close to the caliber of Sarah. And this man was really the caliber of Abraham, in, in a sense. So him and I are in the back trailer. Remember, I'm, I'm in my pajamas. He never asked me once about my pajamas. Didn't ask me about the slippers. Nothing. And... uh he began speaking in other tongues in the back of the trailer. And then I began speaking in other tongues. Do you know he never said a word to me as far as really anything profound or anything? He just shared a testimony with me about him and his wife going into a foreign country as missionaries. He never really shared anything really profound. And it wasn't until later that God showed me, Joseph, I gave you something from that man, from that brother in the Lord, through the Spirit. When he was speaking in tongues. You don't know what I gave you. But I deposited something in you. See God did something in the spirit. That was beyond the physical. But if I didn't obey God that morning. And, and, and not go to work. And was dressed in my clothes. I never would have met that man. And I never would have received from him. And I still don't know to this day. What God gave me. But God showed me. I gave you something that day. Something you need for your journey. Something, Folks, listen, if you're going to walk with God in this hour, you can't lean to your own understanding. you got to walk in the Spirit. And it flows. You flow in the Spirit. You don't question and, and wonder what's this and that and the other. No, you just obey God. And I don't know how many out there are listening to this right now. And this probably sounds way out there to some. But maybe some of you out there are challenged by this and find this exciting and maybe some of you have experienced some of these things but i'll tell you folks there is nothing like walking with god there is nothing like hearing his voice and watching him work and seeing him open doors and seeing the supernatural there's nothing there is nothing absolutely nothing that can compare listen mark cuban can have all the billions he has just let me walk with jesus I want to see the blind eyes open. I want to hear I want to see the deaf ears open. I want to see the lame walk. I want to see the dead raised. I want to see amen miracles by the hand of God. And I know if I walk with God in obedience, I will see God's hand. I will see God's power. Folks, that's what God's looking for in this hour. He's looking for obedience. He's looking for those that know his voice. And are obedient to his voice. God's not looking in this hour for some, for someone that is looking to draw attention to themselves, or somebody that's uh, looking to make a name for themselves, or someone that's looking to be, you know, a big shot and, and have a big shot ministry. No, he's just looking for simple faith and obedience. Are you listening? Childlike faith to to obey our heavenly Father should be our greatest joy. Jesus did always those things that pleased the Father. And friend, you can too. Are you listening? You can too. You can obey God. 
But you got to know his voice. You got to obey his voice. And if you don't obey the Lord and the things you already know to do, he's not going to give you anything. You got to obey the Lord and what you already know to do. Are you listening? God requires faith. Faith requires obedience. Faith requires obedience. And I actually go a step further. Faith is, is, faith is obedience. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. So please let me walk with you, Jesus. Don't ever leave me alone. For without you, Lord, I could never, no, never make heaven my home. So please let me walk with you, Jesus. Don't ever leave me alone. For without you, Lord, I could never, no, never make heaven my home. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Did this message challenge you? Do you want to walk with God? Do you want to hear His voice? Do you want to see His power? Do you want to see God work in this hour? I pray that you've been challenged. Share this message with somebody to challenge them. We need to be challenged in this hour, brothers and sisters, to walk with God. Enoch walked with God. He was not. For God took him. He had this testimony before his translation that he pleased God. Without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you.